Hello and welcome to this afternoon's Physiological Society Education and Teaching webinar. Um, we're going to get started in a couple of minutes and we have quite a lot of people who've registered to attend so we want to give them time to start kind of um, logging in. Um, before we start um, and we do the formal introductions, just going to go through a couple of different things. Um, today the speakers will try to speak as slowly and as clearly as we can within our time limits. We understand that some people find it easier if we speak more slowly, if they're using subtitles or if the quality of the internet connection is not as good. Um, uh, this session will be recorded and will be made available after this session. Um, in terms of some general housekeeping, um, what I would say is that the general format of today will be a 20 minute presentation by each of our speakers. And then we will have around 15 minutes for question and answer. I know not everyone here might be as familiar with Zoom as other kind of platforms. Um, so what we're asking is that if you want to submit any questions through the question and answer um, function, there's a button at the bottom of your screen that you should be able to see. And what we're going to try and do is answer the questions towards the end of the session. But if we see that there are very similar questions from lots of people, we'll try and collect them together in reasonable themes. Um, when we're kind of looking at kind of how questions are submitted, you do have the option to submit them anonymously if you would like to do so. Um, if you are fine with having your kind of name against your question, please include your institution at the beginning of your question and we can try and announce that with your name, just in case people have similar names. You can upvote questions and you can also type your own answers or comments to other attendees' questions, which we would encourage you to do, particularly if there is something that you already know a lot about or you've had answered already by someone else because it might help all the participants. Um, and we're thinking there may be well over 300 people here today. So if we don't manage to get to your question, if we don't manage to kind of um, answer everyone's queries, please bear with us. I think there is a plan that after this session, we will try and put together a kind of frequently asked question kind of brief document to go over the main themes, to give kind of major advice, hints and tips, and to try and cover anything that we don't have time to answer within this session. Um, I will say again, in case people have just joined, please remember that this webinar will be recorded um, and will be available to rewatch. And some of the previous webinars the Society has already um, hosted are already available on their website. Um, I know we'll have lots of people here who are really into, interested in education and teaching, but we'll have people from all sorts of different backgrounds joining in. You are all very welcome wherever you are. Um, I know that the Society has other events planned in terms of webinars devoted to scientific themes and also future teaching events. I think we have at least two future education and teaching town hall webinars um, in the pipeline over August and September. So even if people can't make all of them, there should be something for everyone. So without further ado, I want to introduce our two speakers and I'm going to keep it brief so I don't impinge upon their time. Um, we have Dr. Louise Robson, who's from the University of Sheffield, and I understand that she is the Director of Teaching in Biomedical Sciences at the moment, but she is looking forward to stepping down and having more time for scholarship research in the near future. And we have Dr. Jackie Carnegie from the University of Ottawa in Canada. Um, she's an Associate Professor and both of our speakers are very well published and have undertaken lots of work on active teaching and online education before COVID hit us. I know myself, I had to pivot in a very fast kind of way. Uh, I'm still at a bit of a loss exactly how I will provide the best education I can for my students. I know we're going to learn a lot from our speakers. As we said before, if you have any questions, we'll take them at the end, but you can type them using the Q&A function. And without further ado, I think we'll get started. And our first speaker today will be Louise Robson from the University of Sheffield. Okay, so um, so welcome everybody um, to the webinar. Um, what I'd like to do today is talk to you about my experiences with um, active learning, um, both before um, the emergency pivot and after the pivot. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, a bit about what I did, but I'll also show you some data from a survey that I've done with the students around what they think about um, online active learning and how this is shaping my approach to um, 
what I'm going to deliver um, at, at my own level and also at the departmental level in biomedical science um, in Sheffield. So um, what I thought might be valuable is to give you my definition of active learning because the term active learning can be taken in all sorts of different ways. And for me, active learning with my students is getting the students to learn by doing and getting the students to learn by applying the knowledge and the understanding that they have from the physiology that, that I teach them. And by doing this, um, I aim to enhance the, the knowledge that they've got, their understanding, but really very much their skill set. I'm very much a firm believer that what we need to be doing today is producing graduates who've got a really strong ability to take what they know and apply it to problem solve. Um, and by making them problem, problem solve in the act of learning, I'm actually developing that skill set much more than if we didn't do any active learning at all. Active learning itself has got a huge number of advantages. Um, what I've done here in this slide is, is kind of just draw out the two kinds of teaching. So there's the didactic teaching or what I call one way. And that's because you go, you stand in front of the students and you talk to them, but you don't get anything back. Um, and this kind of teaching is very traditional. I still use some didactic teaching um, in my sessions, um, but I do mix them in with active learning. If you just stand and talk to your students, there's, there's no added value to the session for the students. Um, and I have a lot of colleagues who, when lecture capture came in, for example, grumbled that attendance dropped off. And that's because the students could get what they needed from the lecture capture or going to the live session. And sometimes they had things that meant that they couldn't attend. The students don't get any feedback on their own level of knowledge and understanding. They lose focus. Um, you know yourself, if you're sat in a seminar, um, you know, after about 20 minutes, your concentration starts to wander. And it's the same for the students in a 50 minute lecture. And there's no opportunity for students to engage in the session because they're just listening to you. They're, there's no opportunity for them to actually participate. And actually with those, the didactic session, they really struggle to evaluate the, what knowledge they have and their understanding and what they need to work on to improve things. On the other hand, the act of learning I, is very much a two way uh, teaching session. There's very much added value because there's extra things that the students can participate in. There's ways that they get feedback. I'll show you some examples as I go through my talk. Um, for me, I've seen that the uh, student focus is much greater because we're mixing up the session with all sorts of different activities. It's not just me speaking for 50 minutes. And the session allows students to evaluate their knowledge and understanding, but also gives them that real opportunity to apply their knowledge and understanding to problem solve. So I've been really interested in active learning for quite a few years. I mean, at the beginning of the 1920 academic year, I, I actually decided that I was going to put active learning in every single lecture that I gave. It was going to have some kind of active learning in it. And then I decided to run a research project across the whole of the academic year. And of course that didn't happen, that one stopped in March, but I was gonna do this big research project, look at the analytics and do a student survey. And um, so the active learning I did, um, we've got the ECHO 360 uh, lecture capture platform and it's got an active learning component. So I embedded that, uh, all those questions into my, uh, all my lecture sessions. And um, obviously this was face-to-face -face in attendance and I took two approaches. I added questions into my traditional didactic lecture, so I stripped out some content that wasn't really necessary, and that freed up time for me to put questions in. And then I also ran a number of flipped problem-solving uh, sessions where the students had to do some, some work in advance and then come prepared to the session, um, to have a whole session that was full of, kind of problem-solving and, and questions. I had a few MCQ questions, recall, but not very many. Most of my questions were short answer questions and they were application problem solving. I drew on questions from past papers um, and in terms of the flipped sessions, uh, some of those involved them watching videos, others involved them actually doing some activities, filling in workbooks and tables and bringing that to the session to be able to answer questions. And of course, all of these were recorded they were live in attendance with the lecture capture uh, system that we have. So everything was recorded so students could go and look at it afterwards. Fast forward to March, uh, 
we had three days notice to move all of our teaching online. Um, 6.30 on Friday evening, uh, Friday the 13th, haha, um, basically we got notification that from Monday we will be teaching online. We had a member of staff had tested positive and therefore the whole university was going into an online situation. Um, so I was actually quite, I was able to quite quickly move everything that I was doing online because I already had all of the active learning activities embedded into the online Echo 360 platform. And I decided to use the active learning uh, sessions and activities that I'd already planned to engage with the students online to support their learning, to see whether that could maintain a community of learning with the students and to try and keep them motivated. Um, and I'll talk you through what I did and the, what the students thought about this um, as I go through the talk. But I just do want to say that obviously we're now in the scenario where we've got the COVID-19 situation, but we've got three months notice uh, from the point that we knew that we're going to have to use a blended approach, certainly at the University of Sheffield. But a lot of what I experienced in that emergency pivot back in March, it worked so well. I'm actually planning on using a very similar approach um, in the, the kind of te temporary um, blended move that we're going to have in semester one. So my approach back in March and my approach that I'm going to be taking um, in the next semester, this is for lecture modules, is I'm going to blend asynchronous and synchronous teaching activities. So all of my lecture captures I'm re-recording from scratch. I'm not going to use any old ones that were recorded in live sessions. That's fine for an emergency pivot that is not suitable for a temporary online pivot. So those sessions are not necessarily, uh, the quality isn't as good as it could be. And also there might be information from the lectures uh, that has got nothing to do with the lecture and is completely out of date. So deadlines, for example, for assessments. So I'm recording all of my lectures, breaking them up, chunking them, um, and I'm gonna release them asynchronously. So the students can dip into the lectures when they want, um, and this little icon here is just uh, to remind me that I've, I've set up a little Padlet that I've shared with the students. And I'm asking my students to put their top tips into the Padlet for all students on how to uh, use asynchronous lecture captures because it, quite a few students have indicated they've really struggled with looking at lecture captures instead of being able to attend the live lecture. So I'm hoping to use student uh, guidance to support other students and how to use them. And then I'm gonna back this up with weekly uh, synchronous active learning activities. So we have Blackboard at Sheffield and we've got Blackboard Collaborate. And I, in the emergency pivot, I used Blackboard Collaborate to actually set up kind of group discussions with my students. Um, and what I did was embed into the Collaborate a little bit like we're doing in the webinar today. So we're in Zoom, but I have embedded my presentation so you can see, uh, see my slides. Um, and what I did back in March was embed the active learning questions from the Echo 360 platform into Blackboard Collaborate. So I could use all of the, uh, all of the questions that I'd pre-prepared, uh, getting ready to deliver my teaching from March onwards, and I could embed that into Blackboard Collaborate. And actually that's a really big take home message from me is around the technologies is it's not either or you can you can blend technologies together and i blended turning point technology as well for example within blackboard collaborate and that gave me a really powerful tool that i could use to actually support my students so roll on project number two with a, yet another ethics application that had to go in because it was a separate project um, and what I did for the online session, so here's the face-to-face, -face, so the didactic lectures and the flipped sessions. So what I did was extract the questions that I'd prepared that I'd embedded into my didactic lectures and I, I pulled them out and made standalone active learning sessions. I ran the problem solving sessions I'd already planned and I went through questions on the Blackboard discussion forums and all of the Blackboard collaborate sessions, just like the face-to-face -face sessions, they were recorded. Uh, I let the students know they were being recorded and the students were really happy they were being recorded. There was no, no, no one kind of raised any concerns. And this meant that any students that couldn't attend had an opportunity to go and look at what we'd done and still uh, kind of semi-participate in the act of learning. 
So what I did for both of the projects, face-to-face -face and online active learning, was I've collected module analytics and student survey data. What I'm showing you today is a snapshot of some of the data and it's my initial findings. I haven't finished analysing it, it, partly because I'm planning for next year. Um, but um, there's some really interesting data that's come out and I'm going to share some of, the, some of the key things that I think are really valuable. Um, and just to flag, I did get ethical approval for both of these projects. So in terms of attendance at the Blackboard Collaborate, um, I, I had lectures for level one, two and three. Uh, and for level one, I had up to 64% of students at any one session. 64% uh, as well of the level threes, only 35% of the level twos. And I don't know why it's down. And I haven't had a chance to look at unique users to see whether um, the 35% is actually a bigger percentage of the students. It's just they didn't come to all of the collaborates that, that uh, were actually available. I should point out I don't have attendance data for face-to-face -face because we don't attendance monitor lectures at the University of Sheffield. I wish, In some ways I wish we did because that would have been really nice data to have but I don't have it unfortunately. So when I released the survey, um, at the point that I did the analysis, I had 87 students fill the survey in from face-to-face -face and 94 students fill the online survey in. In face-to-face, 87% -face, of students had used the class uh, active questions. So the questions that I put when we were in the classroom um, and 79% of the students online answered questions. And interestingly, not everybody that attended actually felt comfortable in answering the questions, even though the platform is anonymous. And that was quite interesting for me because we imagine that we make uh, the platform anonymous and the students will, will all answer their questions, but not everybody who attended actually answered the questions, but a lot of the students did. I asked the students about the value they felt that the active learning had to assess their knowledge and understanding, and then also to assess their application of knowledge and understanding. So, so what do you know, what do you understand, and how, how comfortable do you feel now taking that to apply that to problem solve? And I was really interested um, at the beginning of the summer on how face-to-face -face and online compared. And so this slide shows the data uh, from assessing their knowledge and understanding. So on the x-axis, we've got strongly agree all the way down to strongly disagree. Uh, the black represents in-class survey and the blue represents the data from the online uh, Blackboard Collaborates. And this is the percentage of students. And you can see that you know, a, a significant proportion of the students, whether they were in class or online, strongly agreed that having the active learning helped them assess their knowledge and understanding. And, and I've popped a couple of quotes in here. So this quote is around the uh, active learning helping you engage more with the topic and understand it more, rather than just keeping up with getting lecture notes down. And this quote on the bottom is from a student in the online environment and I thought it was lovely because they said that the, the collaborative sessions that we ran with the active learning brought back a sense of normality in university community. So it really helped maintain that community of learning that we would normally expect to have with that face-to-face. -face. And it was still there in the online environment. In terms of applying knowledge and understanding, again, I, there's a very similar profile. And um, we can see that there's a, a significant majority here of the students either strongly agree or agree that the act of learning helps them apply their knowledge and understanding to problem solve. There's perhaps a slight reduction in terms of the strongly agrees, um, but even so, um, in terms of online active learning uh, versus face-to-face, -face, they score very, very highly. And this is telling me that, that my students really valued having that uh, active learning and that, that emergency online pivot. So again, a couple of quotes, one from the online emergency pivot. Um, the department's uh, approach ex excellently emulated traditional attendance-based university teaching, shows that the students valued the active learning and felt that it was of you know, equal uh, value, even you know, compared to the face-to-face. -face. Uh, and then one on the bottom, the sessions were well-structured, and I'll come back to that in a moment, and allow me to apply the knowledge and help me remember the key details more easily. So these data are showing us that the act of learning per se, whether it's face to face or online, is really something very valuable uh, for students. And their students do uh, really recognise the value um, of those active learning activities. 
The other thing I asked the students about in terms of the emergency pivot was how useful was it to revisit the active learning sessions via the recording? So I recorded everything because I knew some students weren't going to be able to make it. And interestingly, remember that 88% uh, of the students had attended the Blackboard Collaborate sessions, but actually almost all of them, even though they'd attended the sessions, still found value in going back and revisiting the recording of what had happened. And of the 11 students who'd not attended, five strongly agreed and six agreed that it was really useful to revisit the active session after it had happened using a recording. And I'm certainly planning next semester when I have my active learning online, I'm absolutely going to record uh, those sessions. So the key points are that students find active learning activities helpful for them to assess and apply knowledge and understanding. They find uh, value uh, in face-to-face -face and um, online teaching approaches with kind of equal uh, value given to those two different circumstances. And they find it helpful to revisit recordings of active learning. I haven't shown you the data, um, but I also had students ask students about preparing for their assessments. And they, again, were very, very clear that the active learning helped them prepare for their assessments. So my top tips, if you want to do active learning, whether it's face to face or in an online environment, is anonymous answering platforms. If you use an anonymous answering platform, so the students type answers in and the answers get shown on the screen, but nobody knows who it is, they are much more likely to answer the questions. It's low risk for them. And in fact, I encourage them, if even if they think they might be wrong, to fill it in because I give feedback on the answers. And this, doing this active learning allows me to provide instant feedback to them on their answers, what was good, what was less good, what needs improving. And I would also aim to allow for peer discussion and support. This is something that I absolutely did face to face. I didn't really do it in the emergency pivot. And that was partly because I'd never used Blackboard Collaborate before. Um, and it has breakout rooms, but I hadn't even used the basic platform. So I kept it simple, but I've been doing some teaching with the students this week, some uh, optional sessions, and, and I've used breakout rooms for peer group discussions, and that worked really well. So it's really important that they kind of bounce ideas off each other. Have a plan. Structure is critical. If you run an online interactive session and you don't have anything planned, it won't work. Uh, having a plan, even if it's just for 20 minutes, helps relax the students, makes them feel comfortable, and then you can go kind of like free reign once you've done the structured session, um, because the students will feel comfortable in that environment. And I would really reinforce application, not recall. So application, we don't really, a, a few questions on, can you remember? But the key thing around the active learning is actually they're using their knowledge and understanding to problem solve. And I will go back to structure because structure, structure, structure of the session is absolutely essential. Um, I popped a little link to a pre-publication that um, I was part of a collaborative team to write, uh, who wrote this back in kind of March, April time. And there's a lot of information in there around that asynchronous and synchronous approach to teaching uh, and, and chat rooms and things like that. So if you're interested, please do go and have a look at that uh, pre-publication. So I'm going to stop there and hand over um, to Jackie. Uh, I'm absolutely happy to take any questions that you might have at the end. Hey, uh, thank you, Louise. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Okay, hello, everyone. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today are some online exercises that I developed uh, to help students studying uh, human physiology to get better at answering short answer questions on summative exams. Um, this was targeted to a third year class uh, in human physiology. So these students would have gone through first and second year in very large undergraduate classes where for the most part, they were answering multiple choice questions. And so they were used to just looking at a particular question stem, going through the choices, and then recognizing what they think might be the correct answer from that list of choices. And as Louise has talked about, it's very important that we um, help them develop their high 
higher order cognitive skills. Most MCQs are going to test their recall, can test up to a certain point their understanding, but with SAQs, then we can really ask them to apply some of their understanding of physiology to novel situations. We can even ask them to analyze some data to evaluate the importance of perhaps treatment options or physiological concepts. We could even go so far as to ask them to design an experiment. Um, so short answer questions can be very useful, can be very valuable, and especially nowadays when we're not only having to teach online, but we're also having to administer our exams online, then SAQs might become even more important because um, with MCQs, they might be able to quickly look up an answer. They might be, it's going to be easier for them to guess or to cheat, whereas with SAQs, they're going to really have to explain what their current knowledge of understanding is. But before we throw them into having to answer SAQs on summative exams, it's very important that we give them opportunities to practice developing their skills to answer those questions. And in order to give them practice, what we also have to understand is what do students find difficult when they are tackling those questions. So in developing my exercises, I worked um, with Gagne's nine events of instructions, especially focusing on the last four. Um, I wanted to give students practice with answering those questions. I wanted them to be able to have immediate feedback when answering those questions. And so I was, I was going to design those exercises so that it could assess how they were answering those questions and give them feedback both for uh, things they were doing well, as well as things they were not doing well. And I was hoping as well that in having the students actively participate in those assignments, that would enhance their retention and their ability to transfer their new knowledge. So first of all, I had to think about what students do wrong when they're answering those SAQs. And I've had years of marking those SAQs for classes. And these are some of the things that I found that students more often than I liked did wrong. First of all, they may just simply not know the content well enough and their answer might not be correct. And so for that, they simply have to study better. Their answer might be incomplete. They might not realize how much they have to provide when answering that question. And so they might start off okay, and then the answer kind of fizzles out without giving me everything that it needed to do so that I could give them full marks. Their answer might start off tackling the question and then kind of drift away and not be really answering the question anymore as they continue. Their answer might not be well organized. They might just be throwing bits and pieces of information at me without really uh, developing an answer that really targets the question and shows me that they understand what they're talking about. And they, sometimes they do what I call spilling their guts where they just seem to see, oh, she's asking about the thyroid gland or she's asking about diabetes. So I'm just gonna give them everything I know about this without targeting their answer to the question itself. So I use some of these errors in the um, exercises that I designed for them. To develop these exercises, I used a software called Quandary that was actually developed here in Canada by Stuart Arneal and Martin Holmes. Um, it's a maze building software. So what it allows you to do is present students with choices, a little bit like those choose your own adventure stories that kids used to read a number of years ago. And then they, as they go through the choices, what I'm hoping they're gonna do in these exercises is build their an outline of how they would answer my SAQ. Uh, and the link there is there for the free download. Unfortunately, it's only available for Windows, not for Mac. I don't know if down the road it'll be available for Mac, but the good news is it's a free download, so anybody can use it. So in the, in the quandary, I still have to use MCQs to take them through the exercise, but the MCQs direct them towards developing their SAQ answer. So what does Quandary let us do? I can use Quandary to 
present a clinical case and use that as, as my SAQ. I can use a practical physiological situation and I'm going to show you examples of both of those. And basically, as the students go through the, the six or seven MCQs associated with each exercise, I'm getting them to problem solve. I'm getting them to develop their understanding and show me their understanding of the physiology that relates to those particular SAQs. Um, with Quandry and in my MCQs that I put into Quandry, I can have as many answer choices as I want. I'm not limited to just four or five. And I can also have as many correct answers as I want. So I can have questions where I ask them to choose more than one thing. I'm going to talk a little bit about the navigation. It's very important that students don't get frustrated when they're going through the exercise. So you want them to be able to navigate easily from question to question. Um, and that's very easy to do in Quandry. What's really good about Quandry is I can give them feedback for every single answer choice they make, be it a good answer or be it an incorrect answer. And with some of the platforms we have, we can't do that. We can give feedback for a correct answer and we can give a generalized feedback for incorrect answers in general, but we can't target each incorrect answer. So in the end, they're going to construct pathways of linked pieces of information, and I'm going to score them as they go along. I will give marks for correct answers, and I can also, I don't do that very often, but I can also take away marks if they choose a really, really bad answer. So as I mentioned, I'm targeting a third year human physiology course with these exercises. And my enrollment in those classes is usually around 120, 130. I, I look for this year, it seems larger. It seems up to about 180. So I can't give them assignments, mark those by hand and give them the feedback in any sort of timely manner. This exercise helps me get around that. So I developed four assignments, tar two of them target the endocrine system, Two of them target the cardiovascular system. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples. Uh, I'll show you a clinical case. I'll show you a physiological situation. And with the physiological situation, we're actually going to look at the couple of the MCQs that I use within that exercise. And please feel free to email, email me afterwards if you want more information. Um, I, can, I can give you more examples and share what I've done with Quandry. Another thing that I really like about Quandry is if they choose a wrong answer, I have the option to send them back to try again. So this really becomes an important formative exercise. And then because completion of each of those four assignments accounts for 1% of their final grade, uh, within their course management system, I ask them to take a screenshot of the final page and I'll show you that final page so that they can send me their score when they have finished. So we're not going to read through this clinical case. We don't have time to do that. But this is my first exercise that I get them to do, and it's associated with the endocrine system. It links to Graves' disease, which they would have learned about either in class or online. And so I'm asking them to take their physiological uh, knowledge about uh, the endocrine uh, regulation um, uh, of the thyroid gland and apply it to Graves' disease. So that's one. And, and so the clinical case is going to capture their attention, and then I'll give them a bunch of MCQs to take them through building their answer to that clinical question. This is another one that I use, and this is the one that we're going to look at in a tiny bit more detail. So this is more of a physiological situation where we have an individual who's going to uh, compete in a cycling ra uh, race at high altitude. Normally, he lives at sea level. So I'm getting them now to really look at this practical example and give me um, some of their knowledge and understanding about the regulation of production of red blood cells as they answer this question. So here what you're seeing in this slide are the six stems for my six multiple choice questions that students are going to go through one by one as they go through this, through this exercise. So first of all, I'm going to ask them what their opening statement will be. I'm going to give them some options uh, and give them feedback on the options that they select. That we're then going to get into the nitty gritty of the regulation of erythropoiesis because it's an endocrine system. I'm going to ask if they need to talk about negative feedback at all. They would have learned about reticulocytes um, in lecture and they would know what a reticulocyte count is. So I'm going to ask them how they might bring that into their answer. And then finally, with the last MCQ, I'm going to bring them back to the actual cycling race and, and, and just kind of get them to sum everything up. 
So when a student goes into a quandary exercise, this is what they're going to see at the very beginning. Uh, at the top, they're going to see what the SAQ is, the whole thing. And then as we go down, they're going to see what is MCQ number one. You're going to see the answer choices. They will click on submit when they're going to send in their answer choice. And you're starting to see a little bit of the navigation under here as well. They're right at the beginning, so they don't have any points yet. And now they're going to be asked to choose what their opening statement should be from this short list of choices. This is choice A, which is not the correct answer choice to choose, so they're not going to earn any points. Um, it's a good idea that he should go there early so he can be acquainted with the cycling route, but that has nothing to do with the physiological regulation of erythropoiesis. So I'm going to tell them it's not the right answer choice, but I'm not going to miss out on an opportunity to teach. So I'm going to say it's a good idea, doesn't really relate relate to the regulation of erythropoiesis. So very importantly, when they click on submit, I'm sending them back to try again. And that's where the navigation is important. Here's the correct answer. So you can see that now this student has earned a point and the student will see that. So the oxygen partial pressure is reduced at the higher altitude. So again, I'm not just gonna say, yes, good job, you got the right answer, but I'm gonna explain why this is the right answer. And now when they click on submit, they're going to be sent to the second question so they can keep progressing through the exercise. Okay, here's what question number two looks like. So I remind them that they've stated that the oxygen partial pressure is going to be reduced. And now I'm going to say, okay, when you're answering this question, how are you going to relate that to the regulation of erythropoiesis? So again, in this instance, they do have five answer choices. Here's a little more navigation now because we're on question two. They have the option to go back to question one if they wanted to revisit it for any reason. And eventually they're going to move forward to question three. So here, one of these answer choices is a really bad answer choice. And this is where I take away a point if they chose that particular answer choice. So first of all, here's the correct answer. B is the correct answer. They earn another point. As he trains at the higher altitude, his kidneys are gonna sense reduced oxygen delivery, release EPO, and that will stimulate erythropoiesis. So I emphasize that in my feedback to them. And now I can just send those guys on to question number three. However, if they chose the wrong answer, you can see they lost the point that they earned by correctly answering question one. I don't do that often, but I do it because I want them to really pay attention to why this was a bad answer choice, not just go, oh, wrong answer. Let me go back and try again. So now they're saying the heart is going to sense a reduced hematocrit. They learn in class. We can, our bodies are not capable of measuring our hematocrit. What they measure is oxygen delivery. And the heart, of course, is not the source of erythropoietin. So I explain why it's wrong. I tell them they've been penalized for choosing the wrong answer. The good news is I'm also sending them back to try again. So they can at least re-earn um, a point by going back and now rethinking and trying to choose the correct answer. They could even, if they want to, go all the way back to question one and, and repair everything. And that's not bad either because it gets them, again, thinking about all of that material. A very quick example of how we can allow multiple correct answers. So this is a different uh, assignment here. We're looking at the Frank Starling Law of the Heart, which is one of my favorite topics to teach. So students should never be surprised if they see a question on it. And so now I'm not using really an example so much as just asking them for some basic physiology about the Frank Starling Law. We're going to jump ahead to MCQ number two in this assignment. I'll just tell you that in the first one, they ended up defining what stroke volume is and starting to talk about that as it relates to the Frank Starling Law. But here I'm asking them to choose three other bits of physiological terminology that they want to use in their answer. And I decided to do this because another thing that I find that students, not always, but too often do when they're answering my SAQs is they don't use physiological terminology. They say, and the body wants to do this, or the heart thinks it would like to do this, and so on. And so I find that they're not using the right language. And so I included this question to get them to think about, okay, what words should I be using? And I'm asking them to find three. So they're gonna to have to choose them one by one, come back each time until they got all three. And then when they chosen the third one, then they'll be able to move forward uh, to the third question in the exercise. 
So you're probably starting to see that navigation is very important as they do these exercises. When they choose the correct answer, that should always keep them moving forward in the uh, exercise. If they choose the wrong answer, I'm always sending them back to try again so that this really is a learning exercise. Um, if they have to choose more than one correct answer, they have to keep going back until they've got all of them. And then once we get past question one, then I'll always have two navigation buttons at the bottom, one that allows them to go back in the exercise and one that allows them to move forward. So when you're in Quandary as a prof setting up the exercise, this is what it looks like when you're in the software. Each time you're sending the student somewhere else, you're using a decision point. So you're setting up multiple decision points in this maze building uh, software. So at the top here, this is my whole SAQ. You're only seeing the top line, but I put my whole SAQ in here. And then number one, this is my first MCQ associated with the exercise because I'm at decision point number one. So I'm asking, as we already saw, what is their opening statement? And then at the bottom here are all of their answer choices as well as any other navigation that I need to include because every single navigation item is going to be a decision point. And I don't have time to go through that in detail, but it is explained in the Quandary software. And again, if you email me, I'd be happy to help you out with it as well. To give the points, we use transactions. So every time they choose a correct answer, they're gonna get a point. Most of the time for incorrect uh, answers, they just don't get any points. I rarely use the taking away point, only when it's really, really important. So as, we, as you're continuing through building um, your exercise in Quandary, now we're at decision point number two. So this is that first answer choice in multiple choice question number one. And now down here, I, I have to use my links below to link them to the feedback. If they choose this answer, uh, they're not going to get a point. So there's no transactions because it's not the correct answer, but they are going to get the feedback. And then I'm going to send them uh, back, of course, to try again. Uh, here now I've jumped ahead to decision point number four where they have chosen the correct answer. I will use transactions to award a point to them. Um, and, and again, we can, I can explain more about transactions if, if, if you send me an email. Um, and so, uh, and again, this is linking to the feedback that is telling them um, that yes, this is the right answer. This is where you want to start. This is why, and now move on uh, to the next question. At the end of the exercise, <coughs> excuse me, this is what they're going to see. So what you're seeing here is the last page in the exercise. This is a summary of the six positive feedbacks, correct feedbacks that I gave to students for the right answer. And really what it's doing is forming an outline um, of what their answer should look like. And here's their points. They've got all six points by answering everything correctly. This is what I ask them to take a screenshot of and submit to me when they have completed the exercise so they can earn that 1% of their final grade. In the last couple of minutes that I have left, I just want to give you a little bit of data on what we found out from students from use, using these exercises. So this is survey data. This is feedback data from the first year that we used it. My N is 100 students. And you can see in general, as you look at this bar chart, that students did in general find the exercises to be helpful, found the feedback to be helpful. That's shown in green. And students always want more exercises. A, because that takes a little bit of weight off the exams. And B, if you can make the exercises interesting and they can see value in them, then they like to do them. Some students did not find the exercises to be sufficiently challenging. I think that's in part because they were doing them uh, uh, at home, um, online, uh, open book. They were able to take as much time as they needed. These are similar to questions that I've used on exams, very similar. And then it's not open book and they can't look up the answers and they're under a bit of a time constraint. When I try to compare outcomes on the SAQs, um, but between not having the exercises versus having the exercises, I really wasn't able to pick up a significant effect. It's very difficult to do that because your student population changes each year, um, your exams change each year, you can't use the same questions over and over again, and even the exam schedule changes every year. So I looked at the two years before and the two years after the introduction of the exercises and looked at the endocrine SAQs and the cardiovascular SAQs. There's a suggestion of maybe a bit of a trend with exam one, no suggestion of even a trend with exam two. So I did not pick up a significant effect. 
So I looked at it in a different way. I looked at a year where I just, where I had the exercises available and I looked at their level of participation in the exercises to see if I could pick up something. So exam one again is going to be endocrine, exam two is cardiovascular. They had two exercises in each case. So I'm comparing students who either did both exercises, students who did only one, students who didn't do either of them. And I had high participation. So my numbers are, very, are much lower, of course, for the other two groups. And I looked at their SAQ scores, um, uh, as well as their overall MCQ to just correct for students who might not be strong students. And then I looked at the gap between those two. And what you can see is that the gap really builds when we have students that especially didn't do either of them. But even there is a beginning of a gap that is significant um, uh, when they did only one assignment. So it does suggest that doing the exercises help them do better on the SAQs, which is usually the tougher part of the exam for students. So in summary, um, I think these exercises are worth developing. It does take some time to develop them, but once they're done, they really work on their own. They give the feedback, they give the score to students, and they give the students practice in developing answers to the, those SAQs. So they're really effective when you have larger classes to work with. The feedback is instantaneous. They'll probably work for other assigned uh, uh, topics like biology, chemistry, physics, even pathophysiology, and students do do them and students do like them, and they've told me that they want to have more. So I thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't go too far over. And again, I would be happy to answer your questions as well. So I'm going to stop sharing and close this. Okay, that's great. Thank you both so much. I know it was a big ask asking you all to kind of put that together, given that everyone's got so much to do. Um, we have had quite a few questions during your presentations. One thing I would say is that if you missed any of the links to any of the resources, or if you're looking for any of the details, remember that this session is being recorded. And I think, if I'm right, the um, sessions, the webinars that the Society has been running are actually freely accessible on the website. I don't necessarily think you have to be um, a member. We'll check that. I know just looking through the audience, we have people from all over the world and I know not everyone here is a physiologist. Everyone is very welcome. Um, some people have been asking about things such as practicals. Um, I know that the society has some events planned. I know that American Physiological Society has some events planned or have taken place. I know that HAPS have various things that have been taking place as well. Um, so I know there's definitely another two education and teaching events which will be dealing with practicals with larger groups, but also smaller practicals or honours projects as well. So they're in the pipeline as well in case people want specialist sessions. So I guess if we start thinking about the questions, um, I'll pose them and either of our speakers can jump in and help us answer these. Um, some of them are near the top, not through favouritism, but just because of upvoting and things. Um, our first question, for the flipped lecture approach, do you find that students always do all of the pre-work or activities in advance? And if not, what tips do you have for maximising this? Thank you, Glenn. Yeah, so um, I'll take this one. Um, I will say it's mixed. Um, I would say that there's a quite a large proportion of the students um, that because it's a little bit different to just turning up to a lecture and sitting there and, and, and kind of writing down notes, they engage really well, they do the work. Um, I would say there's a small subset of students who don't do the work, uh, but actually most of those who don't do the work don't turn up to the session anyway, they're just not engaged students. So, um, you know, for the, the flipped work that I had for the face-to-face -face sessions at level two in semester one, for example, I would say I had probably about 80% attendance in my sessions, and I would say very few students didn't come prepared. Most students came. So for that session, I gave them a table with a list of drugs that impact on the cardiovascular uh, system in the kidney, and they had to, they had to identify the, the targets and the impact of the drug. And then the session was based around some clinical scenarios where they had to identify from symptoms what a patient had and then in, in teams identify the drug from the list that they've done that they might give the patient and explain why. And I, I didn't see very many students sat there thinking I haven't done the pre-work. So I had good attendance and I had good engagement. So I'd say most students in my, my students, most of them are engaging, but I have a small subsection that don't. 
that's great. Thank you. Um, our next question, um, and that kind of really relates to the statement about students maybe only having a 20 minute attention span. And uh, what's the actual evidence for that? I know in my own institution, we're being encouraged to chunk up lectures and kind of intersperse them with activities. Um, would either of you like to comment upon the evidence for the limited attention span or from your own experience? I think the evidence is mixed um, from my own perspective, thinking about my students in class, the ones that go and sit at the back. I can see that their attention starts to wander after about 20 minutes. It's not everybody, but some students, their attention does wander. And if you put something different in the class, it just brings their focus back um, and it just mixes things up and it, it, you help kind of gain their attendance, their, their kind of um, engagement with the session. Um, in terms of the online lecture captures, um, with the emergency pivot, we made a decision in my department that we would just release previous year's lecture captures because we just didn't have the time to re-record them. Um, uh, but as we move into the blended semester one, we are asking everyone to re-record and we are also asking everyone to chunk their lecture captures. So we are asking staff not to just record 50 minutes of a, a lecture capture, but to break it up. I'm breaking mine down into about 20 to 25 minute chunks, possibly smaller depending on the content. Um, and then we're going to release them to students. And um, I did see another question that was linked into the lecture captures. Um, Derek, is it all right if I kind of answer that and tag it on the end? Mm -hmm. So I saw that someone was asking a question about how are you going to release your lecture captures to students? And what we've done is we've each module has a template. So I'm the director of learning and teaching for the department. So I've been leading the department in terms of the approach we're taking and it's a consistent overarching approach. So we're all doing essentially the same thing with small nuances and twists, but the approach is essentially the same because the students want a consistent experience. And what we're doing is we're releasing a certain number of lecture captures each week. And then the following week, we're having one, two or three Blackboard Collaborate interactive online sessions for every single lecture module. And in the handbook, the students are gonna be told which lecture captures are released each week and what each Blackboard Collaborate is going to cover in terms of those lectures. So the students are really clear about what's being released when, and they're really clear about what we're going to cover in the active learning sessions. So they know to get the most benefit from the Blackboard Collaborate, they have to do uh, look at the lecture captures. And so week one, it might be lectures one to four, and then week two will be the next set of lectures, but that's when we have the Blackboard Collaborate. So we're staggering the release over five weeks for a six week lecture module. And then the Blackboard collaborates in weeks two to six. That's great, thank you very much. A um, couple other kind of um, statements and things, but they were kind of relating to some of the data you presented about the level two data um, relating to potentially a dip in student engagement in the second year of a three-year degree. But I know not everyone here has a three-year degree as the format of their curriculum. So again, that's kind of in a way, it's not necessarily a question, it's more of a statement or a kind of discussion point. Um, Charlotte's asking about the mix of asynchronous and synchronous. Um, again, you've answered that to some extent about how many of your colleagues are teaching on modules in a similar manner. manner. As your director of teaching and learning, you probably maybe have a bit more persuasive ability um, than some of us who maybe can't. You know, academic freedom is something people grab onto uh, even during these times. I, I think um, our experience, it wasn't so much in March that I was a director of learning and teaching, though that absolutely helped. I think it was I was recognised in the department as being someone who's got a lot of experience around lecture capture and active learning and how to, to teach and support students using online platforms. And so I was able to use my experience, um, my previous experience, to kind of highlight the value of the approach that I wanted everybody to take. And so we, we opened it up for discussion, but everybody just said, yeah, we'll do that. Um, and actually what I would say is a lot of the staff, having done the act of learning online, uh, are now saying to me that when we go back to normal and attendance, they want to keep doing some kind of active inter interactive sessions rather than just the traditional lectures that they used to do because they really enjoy delivering the sessions and they can now start to see the benefit for the students. So I think yes, being direct learning and teaching absolutely helped. Um, and yes, I think it's important that a department and a degree programme has a consistent experience, but it doesn't have to be absolutely the same uh, for every single module that you're teaching. Okay, that's great. I'm probably um, following on, it's probably still Louise. Don't worry, Jackie, we're coming to you for some questions. Um, the question was asking, 
do you change the length of the lecture provided given it's online and you're adding extra active learning tasks and is the active learning run as sort of a seminar or kind of more of a discussion I suppose rather than the kind of lecture approach so so we have asked staff to review the content of their lectures and make sure that the lecture captures are presenting the key information because it's 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 kind of a it's an information dump that's what the lecture capture is it's just giving them the information and then they have to digest the information and get to grips and understand it and um, what we are absolutely doing is giving students specific guidance on workloads in terms of how long we expect them to spend on a lecture capture how to use the lecture capture so not just the student support for students but we're going to give them some support as well. I'm hoping that my institution, they've said they're going to make a video for students on how to use lecture captures online when there's no live in attendance lecture. We did a video last year for how to use lecture captures after a live lecture. And now we need the equivalent for how to do it when it is the way that it's been delivered. I think shortening the lecture, reducing the content a little bit and chunking them is the way forward. We've embedded the, the one hour uh, interactive sessions into the, the kind of normal learning hours that the students have so we're, we're using that as part of their it's kind of self-directed study time but it's self-directed study in a group environment um there was another question what was the other question oh it's delivered as a seminar and um, it's delivered so the way that i run mine is i might have a couple of slides at the start which is me talking to the students and then each each subsequent slide is a question and the students go onto the platform and they answer the question online and click submit and then I can show the answers and then I'll pick out answers where there's some things that are very good and some things that need improvements and then I might then show them a slide that is if I was answering this question these are the key points that I would make a little bit like Jackie's just done with her quandary software um, but it, instead of the students kind of getting to that by going through that step pathway I'm doing it with them within the session and um, some of the sessions the questions build a little bit like the quandary actually um, so I did a session face to face around the impact of hemorrhage uh, and all the different compensation mechanisms that kick in and we we built we built what is a very complex compensation picture up by doing it step by step but the students had to identify each of the different steps as we went forward and that works really well so it is very much interaction it's them asking questions if they want verbally in the chat box I use emojis so it's it's not the the interactive online sessions you don't want to be just talking to the students you want to be talking with the students and for them to be giving you information whether that's typing a question in the chat box or speaking verbally okay I want to move on to some questions for Jack you know because I see we're running short of time and that, that my kind of the list of questions has jumped because people have been voting on things um, so there's a question about do students need to download quandary in order to access and answer the questions or is it accessed via a link? And how do we deal with people who use Macs, either um, instructors or students? Okay, so first of all, students do not need to download Quandary, so that's good. When you once you've finished your developing your exercise, you save it as a web exercise, and then uh, whatever your learning platform is, we were using Blackboard Learn initially, and now we use Brightspace. Works with both of them. I just put the link in there and then send them off to do it. So I use the assignment function within either Blackboard Learn or. Um, or Brightspace so that they have somewhere where they can send me back the screenshot of their last page and that's all that they have to do. But they do not need the software and um, uh, they can do the exercises um, with a Mac or with, um, with a PC. It's just in order to, for us to use the software to make the exercises, it's only set up for Windows. Um, uh, what was oh long essay style questions? I think so because I didn't use the full capacity of the program. I could have had more decision points, um, and so you just simply if if you want to have more questions that you're going to get them to build, then you just expand the scope of your exercise uh, to get them to really address all of that. And I suppose a question for both of you is that someone's pointed out most of you showed you were dealing with students who knew you and each other. Do you think we're going to have problems when we come to about September when you're going to face students who are new to your institution and know no one? So they don't necessarily have that kind of um, collegiate um, relationship to build on already. Uh, do you both these foresee that that might cause issues in running some of your kind of online classes? 
I can start with this if you'd like. Uh, I, it's been on my mind because I do teach first year students and so they're brand new to university. So I know we're going to have to try to figure out some things to help them uh, get groups, whether they choose their own groups with friends or whether we set them up for them. I'm, I'm kind of in favor of setting them up um, because then it reduces the stress for students. And I've done uh, with some of my classes, because I have classes that are as large as 350 students. So when I do assignments there, I often have them work in groups and you can do that with the learning uh, platforms. So you can set up groups and get them used to interacting with one another that way. Um, and I think we also um, uh, have to do things like have online office hours that are synchronous, uh, as Louisa sort of talked about a little bit with, with doing her synchronous sessions that again will get them starting to interact with one another. I think we have to try to be as visible as we can, um, establish some sort of a presence, let them see us, even if they're only seeing us online, um, and try to really encourage that sense of community. And I'll pass it over to you, Louise, because you did talk a bit about community. Yeah, so we've already started with some of the potential incoming students. So we've already been running some um, interactive online sessions with them, giving them little mini lectures and opportunities to ask questions to start so that using Blackboard Collaborate. So they're already starting to get to see what the, the platform might look like. We've got a, a web page where we've got lots of detailed information. We've got lots of activities planned um, before they arrive, online activities, online activities in terms of the week that they arrive and some face-to-face -face with social distancing. Our staff student committee and our biomedical science uh, society are also planning a whole range of activities, mostly, uh, online, but but there's, there's a lot of things that we're doing quiz, we're going to set quizzes up and doing all sorts of things to try and get that community for the, the first years. And um, we also have PASS, um, so peer assisted study scheme uh, in my department. So our level two students uh, work with and mentor our level ones and they work with individual tutorial groups. And so um, we think that's going to also help to get them settled in. But I think, I think there's a real big challenge actually with the first years, massive challenge. You know, most of them have been out of education since March, uh, and that by itself is a challenge for them coming into university. But then to come in with all the social distancing and the, the kind of different way of learning, it, it is going to be a big challenge. And I think I think that's our big focus at the moment in terms of all of our planning to do the best that we can to try and kind of get them into that that feeling of having a community. Okay, that's great. <laughs> We've just passed um, 4 p.m. and I suppose we better end it there. I know we haven't managed to address every single question that's been answered. I know some of the participants have been answering. That's very much appreciated. Just to confirm, the recording for this session will be open access and it will be on the Physiological Society website. I think the plan is that we're going to try and summarise the content of today's webinar in a kind of frequently asked question document, along with any links, hints and tips that we can offer. I know we've also referred to some other stuff, particularly in the kind of final broader question about suggestions for engendering that sense of belonging at the start of moving towards this brave new world. I'd like to thank all of you for taking part. I should reiterate again, there are more events um, coming um, on stream to do with education and teaching for the society. I know someone's pointed that out within the, um, the chat and the live feed. If you would like to join the education and teaching theme of the Physiological Society, or any theme in the Physiological Society, um, you are very welcome. The other scientific themes are planning schedule of activities as well, and some of them are already published on the website. And with that, it just leaves me to thank our two speakers today, all the participants from around the world who took part. You are very welcome, and it was very much appreciated that they took the time to be here. Um, and I'd like you to wish you good afternoon from the UK, um, and I hope you have a good rest of the day wherever you are around the world. Thanks very much for your attention.